Good afternoon and welcome everyone and thanks for joining. Uh, my name is Anna Castelli and I am working for Europark Federation uh, supporting the Healthy Park Salty People Commission since one year now. Uh, thank you for um, for, uh, for the interest and please I wanted to let you know that we are recording and we would really like to see you. Uh, but if you are not comfortable with recording, you can switch off your camera um, because this event will then be uploaded in our website. Uh, although it's very nice to see the audience most of the time. Um, as I said, for those who don't know me, my name is Anna Castelli. I'm supporting the HPHP Commission and I am also responsible for the Interreg European Project uh, Green Health, when, uh, where uh, Europark is advisory partner. This is the first Healthy Park, Healthy People um, webinar for 2023. Um, the people who uh, never joined us uh, probably don't know that we normally meet twice a year with uh, quite different topics. This, uh, this is the first uh, time that we actually uh, host a topic that is related to specific uh, condition, health condition. Last time we met in uh, 2022 in, in December. Um, I encourage you to put the questions in the chat uh, as soon as they come, because they will we will collect them and uh, reply at the end of the session or at the end of, 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 of the webinar. And uh, we will also share the documentation of this session in our website. I will share the link um, so that you can um, that you can um, um, connect, but also you will receive an email because you registered with uh, everything uh, in your email box. Um, as, um, as I said, uh, we will use the chat for the question, uh, write your name and organization in the chat so we pretty much know who you are and where you are joining, if you are from a protected area, if you have a health background, or if you are a researcher, or if you are just an interested person. And at the end, we will have an evaluation form in the chat, and we would appreciate that you fill it in. It just take a couple of minutes. So today, uh, our topic is about the benefits uh, that Nature Connection provides to persons affected by dementia and their carers. And as usual, uh, we are uh, uh, introducing some practices uh, from different countries. So today we have United Kingdom and Austria. Um, I would like to welcome uh, Peter Oakcliffe, uh, the Europark uh, Federation Vice President and also the Chair of uh, um, HPHP uh, e, uh, Commission. Um, Gordon Malcolm, who is joining us from the UK too, um, who is going to present a, a case study on dementia and venture and giving an introduction. And Susanne Kefa, who is um, uh, introducing us uh, practice from Austria. Uh, at the end, we will have a wrap up and conclusion. And now I hand over to you, Pete. Thank you. Thanks, Anna, and welcome, everyone. It is really good to see everyone, even though we're only connected by TV to this afternoon. And I have to say, I'm based in Scotland. I work for Nature Scott, which is Scotland's uh, nature agency. Uh, and it looks like rain in Scotland. And that's because the schools have broken up when our weather traditionally changes. Um, so uh, I work for Nature Scots. I cover a range of work, including health and well-being, but also national parks and nature reserves. But I'm here wearing a slightly different hat today as, as vice president of the Europark Federation. Um, for those who don't know the Federation, it's Europe's largest network of nearly 400 national parks and protected areas across 37 countries, so slightly wider than Europe. And you can see uh, information about the organization and its work here. And I guess I, I'm bound to say as a, a vice president, if you or your organization are not a member of the Federation, then why not consider joining it, joining us so we can continue to put on free webinars such as this one. Next slide, please. As well as the honor of being a vice chair, I also have a real pleasure of chairing its Healthy Parks, Healthy People Europe Commission. And the next few slides, I'm gonna introduce the main elements of this program. The Federation program was launched in June 2020. It draws inspiration from the global program and leadership of park agencies in countries such as Australia, Canada, the US and South Korea, 
but it's also very much based on the interest and practice that have been developed across Europe. And it tries to draw on that practice um, in developing what we want to do in Europe. Our vision stated here is a simple one. Uh, we're simple people, of course. It's for happier and healthier people, more connected to nature-rich parks and protected areas. And the programme is built around what we call four pillars, which support the development of the approach. And the four pillars being making the case, building partnerships, particularly with the health sector, but also other sectors within local authorities, with transport departments, with education authorities, etc. Developing capacity and practice, uh, particularly within our staff as, and organizational abilities, and connecting people and nature through green health activity. So doing specific things which deliver health outcomes. Next slide, please. And the purpose of a program is to encourage more protected areas and national parks to do more of this. Listed here are some of the specific elements we think are most relevant to build on when we're doing this sort of work. Um, first and foremost is actually a, a, a clear focus on a health outcome. Uh, we do lots of um, healthy activities for the general population as parks and protected area managers when we welcome people onto our sites and areas. But actually, green health activity is primarily focused on a specific condition. And they need to be designed to live spe that specific uh, condition too. Often developed in partnership with the health sector, the local GV practice or the national agency. And uh, we're quite passionate about the uh, what, uh, process developed in the UK around the five ways well framework, originally around mental health, but is very effective in connecting people and nature and delivering health outcomes for people and uh, greater benefits for nature too. Another area we think uh, requires a bit of attention is around how we monitor and evaluate health outcomes of these projects and activities. Um, often that can include in partnerships with academics, an area that we need to develop if we want to develop and promote those sort of magic numbers around the impact of what we do. And finally, um, the other area that we think is really important, and that's why I'm delighted to see so many people here today is about uh, addressing, I guess, knowledge, training and capacity needs of our staff and organisations. Um, the health sector is complex. Um, uh, the terminology is very different to the world of park managers, and we need to get our heads into the space while not becoming health experts, of course, but being able to be able to deal with the sector in a, a, a reasonable and a proportionate way. Next slide, please. I suspect we'll touch on most of those elements actually in the work in the in presentations we got today. And if you have any questions, particularly around those areas, it would be good to hear them uh, during during the course of the, today's session. The Commission has been working away quite merrily now for about ten years, um, and we've we continue to work on a range of resources that are listed here. We're very close to having presented about thirty times that webinars, conferences and events and to specific parks in, at times as well. Uh, and yet we still find the interest in this work is growing amongst protected area of managers. And we launched the program in 2020 and obviously that was the time of uh, peak COVID. Um, and COVID has had a real uh, impact on the relevance of this program uh, to many park areas, park and protected area managers. Um, as Anna will undoubtedly um, uh, want me to say we collect case studies um, of good practice and we're still in the market for new ones, new and exciting ones, particularly from parks and protected areas and countries we haven't heard of before. You can see a list of these on our current website. Um, and we've recently created a LinkedIn group for information exchange and hopefully some discussion around this issue. Um, the link will be in the chat if you want to join. We're also members of the IUCN Specialist Group on Health and Wellbeing and have contributed to the most recent call to arms, uh, Nature is Good Medicine, which was part of the World Parks Congress in Marseille a couple of years back now. And I think Anna's mentioned it, one of the more exciting things that's happening now is our involvement as partner in the new Interreg project on green health, which brings together a range of organisations from Spain, Ireland, Sweden, Croatia and Poland, some at the very beginning of their HPHP journey, some 
experience there. And we're using that project uh, as a learning experience to test uh, the final thing that we've done, uh, which is the toolkit, which we refreshed in 2021. But uh, that's a, a, what we call our compass, a vital resource where we've brought together all the information and all the learning that we've got uh, around healthy parks, healthy people, and specifically aimed at park managers. It includes a checklist of things that elements of green health projects I've discussed and goes into a wide range of detail. So if you've never seen that before, that's really worth looking at. Uh, next slide, please. So as well as this webinar and asking lots of questions at it, uh, please feel free to get engaged. You can join our LinkedIn group, as I said. You can submit a case study. Uh, and we're also looking uh, for new members of the commission all the time. So if you're interested, please contact Anna. And she's given her email address on that slide there, which is excellent. OK, we can probably end the slideshow. And I'll just set up the, the, the main event. So I've provided a, a brief glimpse of a bigger picture, which hopefully will be Familiar to some of you, uh, maybe new to more of you as well. But today's specific subject is dementia. And this is the first time we've looked at a specific health condition in more detail. Um, and it's very much front page news. Well, it is for us in, in Scotland and the UK. And it's a condition which probably impacts most families in the UK now to some extent. Um, but actually, the real inspiration for you choosing this topic came from uh, the uh, annual conference, the delayed annual conference we held in Austria in, in May 2022, where we had a, a fantastic World Cafe session to begin the, the event. And I ended up on a table um, talking about healthy parks, healthy people, Europe, uh, with a range of colleagues from Greece, from Finland and Austria. Uh, and one of them asked, uh, is anyone doing anything on dementia programs? And the other three responded, oh, yes, there's quite a lot of work going on around dementia programs in our in our parks and some of our parks, um, which perhaps surprised all of us as well. That, that was so much going on. So um, on the back of that, we've been thinking about how how we uh, share experience on this issue. And today is very much in that spirit of trying to share some of this experience that we already have as protected area managers across across Europe. So without further ado, let me hand over to Gordon from Dementia Adventure, who, as well as introducing himself, is going to provide uh, some short introductory material on, on the condition and then uh, go into a case study, a, a literally a case study adventure. Um, over to you, Gordon. Thank you very much, Pete. Um, yeah, so I'm from Dementia Adventure. Um, we're a small UK charity and we're very pleased to be able to be asked to talk to you a little bit about dementia for 10 minutes as a, just a general overview and then obviously to share a case study of a project that we've worked with with one of our community partners. So I'm just going to share my presentation with you so we can get started. So. Dementia Adventure is a small UK charity. We were founded in 2009 by a husband and wife team who found that when their uh, three of their grandparents developed dementia, that actually what often happens is that people's world starts to shrink and they actually stop doing the things that they love. They spend a lot more time indoors and that meaning and purpose and that sense of adventure often is diminished. So Dementia Adventure was set up and this is our vision to provide a more active and fulfilled life for everyone living with dementia. And when we're talking everyone, we're talking about people living with dementia themselves, but also family, friends and their carers. Our mission is to support people living with dementia to get outdoors and experience the benefits of nature. So the charity was originally set up to run supported holidays for people living with dementia and their carers. But also that developed over time since 2009 to actually share the work that we do, because our work is grounded in research about the health and well-being benefits of connecting with nature. And we were finding more and more that organisations wanted to hear the positive about what people could do to slow the progression of the disease. So we work in partnership with people living with dementia to co-produce all our materials. And obviously, you'll get a feel of some of those today. 
So these are some of our community partners. We work with the National Trust and other wildlife, green and blue space organisations in the UK. We also work with local authorities, care homes, health uh, healthcare professionals. And also, as I say, our work is always grounded in research, either the research that we've undertaken that's on our website or that we've undertaken with UK universities. Today, when we're looking at dementia, obviously, um, some of you may not have thought of actually including people living with dementia in some of your um, activities or experiences that you're planning. But obviously, what I want you to think about today is when we're talking about dementia, dementia is a condition that affects cognitive ability, so brain function and sensory sensitivity. And so the information that we share today will benefit so many other groups of unique individuals, young people, people with special needs. So as this quote from Wendy Mitchell, who's Wendy's living with dementia, and she's also a passionate advocate, it says, if you get it right for people living with dementia, you get it right for so many other groups of people. So just to give you a brief overview, obviously we run two hour training talking about understanding dementia better. So this is just a 10 minute whirlwind tour, but dementia is an umbrella term for a range of conditions that affect the way the brain functions. It's progressive, it deteriorates and it's non-curable. And there are over 200 forms of dementia. On the screen, you just have a few identified. But as I say, it is this umbrella term. People often feel that it's related to getting older, which obviously age is the biggest risk factor, but people can develop dementia at any age. And in the UK, there's currently 900,000 people living with dementia and 45,000 of those are under the age of 65. So I've been di diagnosed with early onset dementia. The young, youngest person we know at Dementia Adventure that's developed dementia is a, a child of two years of age. So as I say, that condition is very rare, but there are many, many conditions that actually affect the way the brain functions. Because obviously you're in a European organisation, I just wanted to share with you some European data for you. So within the European Union, obviously there are, in 2019, it was seen that there were 7 million, just uh, nearly 8 million, uh, people living with dementia and obviously the estimates are that these numbers are going to double uh, by 2050. Obviously the uh, figures underneath also identify the area not just covered by the EU but the other areas and the other countries within the European Union that the Alzheimer's Europe organization covers and therefore those figures are slightly higher but as you can see the numbers are still expected to double by 2050. That's because we're all a uh, uh, living a little bit longer and therefore the prevalence and the incidence of dementia is going to increase. So in terms of dementia people often ask us are there ways of preventing or reducing the risk of developing the disease. Now the Lancet Commission com uh, produced a report in 2017 and then redid the report in 2020 and identified a range of conditions that actually and situations that can reduce our incidence of developing dementia. So the first is we can reduce our incidence by 7% by education. So people who experience lower education levels, so only up to primary age, then obviously they are more prevalent to develop the condition. In midlife, there are things that if we look after our hearing and actually things like hypertension, our alcohol consumption and our obesity, so our weight, obviously, if we allow those uh, to increase to a particular level, then they increase our risk of developing the condition too. And in later life, smoking, depression, social isolation, physical inactivity and air pollution and diabetes have all been identified as contributory factors to developing dementia. So that means that the modifiable factors, there are 40% um, of the factors that are modifiable. And actually, if we make life changes, we can reduce the likelihood of developing the condition. However, there are still 60% of unknown reasons why the condition is developed. At Dementia Adventure, we're all about understanding that with the right support we believe that people living with dementia can do anything and can achieve amazing things and it's still about having a happy and fulfilled life even after diagnosis but there are barriers that we need to consider and for you as organizations need to consider for the barriers that people face living with dementia to get outdoors so 100% lack confidence to get outdoors 
68% also are worried about becoming confused in unfamiliar environments. People are also worried about getting lost, about their mobility issues, because their mobility declines. Are they going to be able to cope in unfamiliar environments? So they're really keen to know about the accessibility arrangements, the seating, that there are different routes and different paths they can take, depending on how they're feeling on a particular day. And also not wanting to be a burden on others. So they really do want to ensure that actually people have a basic understanding of dementia because otherwise they feel that they could be misunderstood, their actions could be misinterpreted, and therefore they may become confused, upset or embarrassed in going to unfamiliar environments. 40% of people whilst living with dementia also suffer with depression and likely to have an episode of depression. So understanding that is really, really key because keeping that meaning and purpose, keeping that physical activity can really reduce those feelings of anxiety and depression. So we're just going to watch a short video by um, Chris and Jane. Chris is living with Alzheimer's and mixed dementia. And he's just going to describe to us just how important it is to connect with nature. I, I sometimes go out in the garden to sit down and have a few tears on my own. Um, I'm not going to get disturbed, I'm not going to be embarrassed and it's something I do now and again. And the other day I was doing it, I don't use it today, maybe the other week, and a hedgehog came out and immediately I was distracted from my anxiety, my stress, my depression. I didn't have dementia, I didn't have any problems at all and that's what nature does for you, it distracts you, it's beautiful, it doesn't ask anything of you. It just displays itself and, and is there for our appreciation. He was just in the moment, just him and this hedgehog just walking past. Just, was it two feet? Just two feet yeah. away from him? Yeah, yeah. And it just got on with its life. And I just sat there and I watched him going backwards and forwards and even the cat come across. And the cat was watching it as well. It's obviously had dealings with the hedgehog because it didn't go for it. But even the cat was watching as well. And and and. and I now go out and I look for these things now. And it, it's beautiful. It, it's, there is no, um, you don't fail. You don't succeed. You just observe. And there's no, there's no um, um, pressure. pressure. There's no pressure. The, 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 it's just there for you to appreciate and distract you. And you are normal again. You know, you're not that person with, with dementia. You don't have any problems at all. And I think that goes for any, anyone and everyone. So I hope you'll agree that Chris describes really beautifully there just what um, connecting with nature means to him. So why? Well, actually, it helps to connect us to our emotional memories. It helps to distract us. It helps us to feel normal again. And if people are struggling with memory loss, which may be affected by their uh, dementia affecting the hippocampus, their amygdala, their emotional memory stays intact for much longer as part of the journey. And connecting with nature has an amazing way and a capacity to trigger that connection to our emotional memories, because some of our earliest experience, our fondest experiences, are connecting with the outdoors. The health and well-being benefits, well, Chris identified, it lowers his depression, but it also, it gives us a sense of well-being and research that we've done and other organisations have identified, it gives us a sense of belonging. It improves our sleeping and eating patterns, our verbal expression, stimulates our memory and provides us the opportunity to be captivated by the attention of nature and the great outdoors. Why? Well, actually what happens is the light levels, we get increased vitamin D levels and that has an in, in, impact on our bodies. Serotonin levels uh, are increased, our happy hormone. Cortisol, our stress hormone reduces. And therefore we actually feel better because endorphins, dopamine are increased just by our, con uh, our contact with the outdoors. And also our immune system is also improved as a result. And again, 
for dementia prevention, it's all about keeping the brain active because the more we can keep our brain active, the more we can slow the progression of the disease. We can't stop the progression, but we can slow it. This image just shows you that sitting quietly, it shows you the brain activity, but compared to a 20 minute walk. And again, nature naturally is multi-sensory and can stimulate the brain to ensure that it's kept active for longer. And this final quote for the presentation, a lady called Wendy Mitchell, who we met at the beginning of the presentation, she also says, when I'm stuck inside, I've only got my dementia for company. And it's not a very good house guest, but when outside, it seems to dilute my dementia. And as Chris identified, it makes him feel normal again. So just why connecting with the outdoors and dementia adventure do what we do. So that's the end of this presentation. Are there any questions, Anna? I know that you're monitoring the chat. Is there anything that people are asking at this point or would you like me to go on to the case study? At this point, if something is not coming in the moment, no. So you can go ahead and maybe something will pop up. Lovely, thank you very much. So I'm going to just go forward now because, as I say, Dementia Adventure runs supported holidays. We run training, but we also work with organisations to become dementia friendly and to actually open their facilities to run dementia accessible experiences. So the case study that I'm going to share with you today is about a case study that of working with Bradgate Park in Leicestershire in the UK, improving accessibility and expanding their learning engagement opportunities. So Bradgate Park is an 830-acre site. It's got mixed, accessible and wild and rugged landscapes. It's got a site of special scientific interest within its grounds, and it's also got a protected ancient monument. It's got a beautiful deer park dating to 1241 with uh, a number of deer that they look after as well. I'm just going to share with you a short video just to give you a flavour of what Bradgate Park is like so you know what we're, where we're talking about in the UK. I think you'll agree it's a beautiful site and obviously it already had worked very hard and was a very accessible site but it was very keen to improve its accessibility to actually improve to for particular marginalized groups within the UK and obviously one group was people living with dementia. They lack confidence in understanding what people living with dementia would need in terms of support. And so they wanted some training and advice about how best to approach organizations to then start welcoming them onto their site. They also wanted to make their experiences more multi-sensory. Obviously they've got the most amazing site, but how could they make some of their experiences more accessible? Because dementia can affect any of the senses so it's really key to provide multi-sensory experiences so that everybody has the opportunity to engage and they also wanted to um, look at next step planning and obviously what they could do to further develop their site so the training that we delivered and we supported with them with we'll actually co-produce and we actually bes provide bespoke training for any organization that's looking to gain support from us but the most important thing is that we encourage organizations to co-produce whatever they're doing with people living with dementia because it's great that they wanted to open the uh, um, gates and actually increase in involvement of people living with dementia coming to their site but first of all it's really important what people are looking for and what people in their locality feel are the barriers to accessing their location. 
We also, we looked at the health and well-being benefits of connecting with nature, engaging people with walks and looking at communication tips and strategies because dementia affects different people in different ways. And so it was about empowering people to understand how to support people, depending on what type of dementia they had and the types of communication difficulties or mobility difficulties or sensory impairments they may have. We also looked at creating sensory experiences, so ways in which we in our th uh, over 13 years of experience now, nearly 14 years of experience, have actually created multi-sensory opportunities and providing uh, skills and expertise to help them to do that too, and looking at practical venue specific experiences that they could create. So the feedback that we got from the training, they thought it was excellent um, on how to negotiate a setting and actually to make it dementia friendly. So we looked at paperwork, we provide tools and templates so that not only can we inspire people, but we leave them with materials that are there for specialists and non-specialists of people who haven't worked with dementia before to be able to risk assess, to evaluate and to plan activities for everyone. It also, the impact, they've definitely been a catalyst to explore dementia-friendly activities. So as soon as we've done the training, the volunteers created instantly during the day, lots of opportunities and ident identified places and experiences that they would integrate into their health walks that they were going to be running to help engage people at different points along their journey. And also making sure those journeys were of different lengths to cater for different ability needs. We also supported, because again, by working with other community groups, such as people living with dementia, the, the organisation was then able to apply for additional grant funding to actually broaden their participation. So they wanted to run opportunities for people to be able to connect with nature, to learn about caring for the environment, but also for about being about the health and well-being benefits of getting outdoor and embracing that sensory experience. So they wanted to create this woodland workshop that it was not only going to be accessible for people with dementia, but for other people with other needs too. They also wanted to consider how they could continue to work in partnership. So it wasn't just about working on a one-off, it was about continuing to work in partnership to draw people in, to enable the park to be used more widely in terms of green uh, therapeutic support. So in the UK, there's a huge push for um, green social prescribing. So rather than going to a doctor and getting a medical prescription to solve a medical problem, green social prescribing uh, is now uh, promoted by our social prescribers who work within GP surgeries. So providing non-medication based therapeutic support for people experiencing different, different, different medical conditions. And obviously they wanted to get involved in this too. And again, they identified that we'd made it easier and actually much more um, accessible for knowing how to connect with those organizations and how to approach them. So the learning that they took away and hopefully that you might take away from today's session is that it's really key to raise the awareness and the skill level of staff and volunteers to enable people to feel comfortable to know a little bit more about dementia, about how to support people and the best way possible. Also, what is key is not to think what you would like to do for people living with dementia, but design it with them. They will absolutely want to know that they're part of the process because then they will be your greatest advocates to actually celebrate what you're doing, to promote it and to get other people living with dementia and their carers to attend. Making things accessible, Again, the routes at Bradgate Park were accessible, but it was looking at those finer details of different routes, maybe some additional seating, even bringing seating and temporary seating to enable people to be able to rest and recuperate and re-energize during their experiences so that they felt that they could fully engage. It was about providing multi-sensory opportunities, understanding that quiet areas are really important for people with dementia. If they start to become anxious or overcome by the environment, just quiet opportunities for them to actually relax and to provide the information in a variety of formats because people the greatest barrier for people accessing outdoors is their anxiety about will they cope they need a lot of information to encourage them to even step over their threshold so it's providing that providing a telephone helpline so that people can ring up and i inquire but they the more information you can provide people about how dementia inclusive your experience is they will feel comfortable safe and secure in putting their trust in you to come and enjoy an experience at your site. 
and broadening your participation and partnerships with dementia will also support in all sorts of ways and opens doors for additional funding and exciting opportunities for the future. And so what did we help with? Well, it was about increasing that confidence to take projects forward and hopefully to sort of continue well into the future. So thank you for listening. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them at the end. There are our details from Dementia Adventure and do look us up. We have lots of other case studies of the work that we do on our website. Thank you very much. Thanks, <coughs> thanks, Gord. A really rich case study and it's probably got us all thinking. Um, I wondered whether I could ask just one question and others might want to chip in other questions. I can't see any on the chat at the moment. Um, what do you think um, for the for park manager, what was the most difficult thing for them to get their head around, do you think? I think, first of all, it's it's feeling comfortable about providing support for people in with dementia and their carers, understanding what life looks like and what are the barriers that people are facing. So I think, you know, some basic understanding, dementia awareness, understanding of what can be done to help people to be positive and empowering and to provide people with help and support was, was first. I think the other was really understanding what is preventing people accessing um, green space, really, that there is a great anxiety from carers that the person that they're supporting isn't going to be safe, they're not going to be understood, they're going to become maybe confused, overcome, misunderstood. And so removing that fear by providing carers with information, so providing in a, a format that provides them with all the information that they need is really key because it just helps the carer and the person with liver and dementia feel confident to step outdoors and actually engage with community organizations which they'd love to but it's just about increasing confidence okay thank you so increasing confidence is important i'm just picking up a question from uh, dita uh, apologies if i got your name wrong about um surely everyone's too busy to do this and how do we um uh, how do we get uh, the, the nursing staff uh, to think that this is a good thing to do rather than just another burden on them. Yeah, a, I mean, a more general question there. Yeah, I mean, we work with care organisations because actually what happens is by engaging people with connecting with the outdoors, it actually creates, um, you know, it aids communication, it reduces agitation. So for, for people in care settings, because I, I train people in care, care homes, care settings and health professionals, but actually it's about understanding that just small steps, small things um, can actually make a real difference. So for people that can't get out, it's actually maybe just bringing something in from the outdoors to actually engage, to trigger that opportunity of a connection. And as I say, we're not looking at big adventures outside. Those health and wellbeing benefits on that slide that I shared, that was just 10 minutes outdoors. So for peer professionals, when we're talking, we're talking about maybe having a cup of tea, maybe just going outside and filling up a bird bath or a bird bird feeder in a care setting. Small things can make big differences and can really start to unlock people's um, capacity to communicate and also reduce people's agitation, which then has dividends into, in terms of being able to support them in that caring role, which is so can be really challenging at times. Thanks, Gordon. So there's something there about the health benefits of the activity justify the the investment in it. Absolutely. Um, and Absolutely. That's, what, that's the sort of message we need to get across. So the final question I'll just pick up from Heather Mc, uh, McKee from North York Moors. Um, what's, what's, what's the way you present this information? Uh, you've obviously given us a very powerful couple of videos there, or at least one video about the power of a hedgehog. Yes. Um, but uh, what sort of information do you use to, um, to, uh, to, to provide to health professionals or carers? We use latest research, so we are actually a sort of a, a, a magnet for information. So we actually provide latest research from the UK and around the world. But also the most important thing for us to stand out is about sharing the lived experience. So we've made 95 short films like the Hedgehog film that we share people's lived experience of living with dementia. The challenges, yes, but most importantly, the ways that actually those challenges can be addressed. So we're all about empowering and using the voices of people living with dementia through either 
of the videos that we have, but also we have over 13 years of experience of taking people on adventures themselves on our adventure holidays that we take every year. So we have a wealth of storytelling and it's about sharing that lived experience to empower people to say, this is what the difference it makes. So um, as I say, we believe our training is very engaging. It's very um person-centered and based on real lived experience rather than just about science. It's really about what works and what has actually worked for us and other organizations. Thank you very much, Gordon. That's been great. Um, I'm going to move us on. Um, if you've got any more questions or think of any more questions while the next case study is on, uh, put them in the chat and we'll have a, a wrap up session at the end too, to have any discussion. Suzanne, I'm going to pass on to you. Uh, please, you can you can introduce yourself far better than I can. So please tell us about a little bit about yourself and then uh, on with a case study. And I think we're going to have a, a contrasting case study here, but with some common elements. Let's see. Suzanne, mm -hmm. over to you. Thanks a lot, Pete. Um, my name is Susanne Kiefer. I'm living in Austria. Uh, my norm, normally I'm working for uh, Sparbach Nature Park, which is the oldest nature park in Austria. But in this case, I'm um, uh, in case of dementia. I'm on the one hand, I'm infected because my mom is suffering from dementia, and on the other hand, um, it is the project. I'm there involved as a volunteer, and in the, this case, I'm presenting this uh, case. Uh, this afternoon to you. Um, Esther, can I please, uh, please get to the presentation? Uh, the next one, please. Uh, what I'm talking about today is uh, about the, it's a, the case study, the dementia friendly region. Uh, Wir 5 in Wienerwald, it's uh, located at the Biosphere Reserve Wienerwald in Austria. Um, I will introduce the region to you. I will introduce the community uh, via FIMP in, Wien in Wienerwald and a little bit about the project. And uh, as its usual uh, links and references uh, and some additional information. The next one, please. Um, there's a map um, of the Biosphere Reserve Wienerwald. You see the orange line in this, inside this orange line, uh, this is the Biosphere Reserve Wienerwald. Uh, we have parts of Vienna and parts of the district of Lower Austria. Uh, I think it's better uh, to, to get to the next one uh, to get a little bit more in detail. Um, on the left hand side, the bright gray is the district of Lower Austria. The orange field in the middle is the Biosphere Wiener Reserve Wienerwald. And in the middle, the dark gray, gray is the city of Vienna. And the dark orange part is the region uh, uh, V5 in Wienerwald. And on the uh, larger map, you see the, the five communities, Wolfsgraben, Burkersdorf, Tulnerbach, Gabitz, and Mauerbach. Yeah, and as you see, these um, communities are close to the, to the, I would say, border um, uh, in between Lower Austria and Vienna. So yeah, thanks. The next one, please. As I said, this uh, VR5 or the V5 in Wienerwald are five communities uh, located in this district of Lower Austria, close to the uh, city of Vienna. This platform, VR5 uh, in Wienerwald, uh, this network was established in 2017. There are about uh, 32,000 inhabitants. Um, and in 2019, 36% of the population were aged 55 plus. So uh, you can see this, um, as it is a region where uh, the, the people try to find uh, uh, a good place to live. It's, it's outside of Vienna, it's in the green space. It's a high quality of living. We are, have a, a good infrastructure, depending on schools or, and even on, 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 uh, in, the, in, the, in the cities and villages, you have um, all you, I would say, all you, all you need for, for wirklich, for a, a, an, as for a nice place to live. And we uh, have a good infrastructure on public transport uh, on one way to Vienna and on the other hand to uh, St. Pölten, which is the capital city of, of Lower Austria. And there is also the motorway uh, linking to both uh, in both directions. Yeah, thanks. The next one, please. Yeah, getting to the, to the project. 
uh, Dementia Friendly Region uh, Revive in Wienerwald. Uh, the project is has started in January 2022 and it will be finished by the end of this year. Um, the focus areas are about information about dementia. It's also rising awareness on dementia. And it is also to set up a first place in this region for a, a daycare. We are going, looking forward that it will be it will happen in, in autumn this year and we will have 15 places for a, a daycare um, for the whole region. And so if you, if you remember 32,000 inhabitants and um, approximately 40%, 55 plus. So it will be, I think the list of, of, of places, the ones who are waiting for places are still longer than the, the, the number of places. Maybe it will be necessary to establish in the future in every one in uh, these uh, small district uh, regions, uh, uh, one of the um, one, a daycare place. So, and how we do that? Um, there are network meetings and uh, to set up a program. There are information meetings in the region, so the, 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 the public gets more information and is not uh, fearing dementia anyway. Uh, there are some regular tables uh, for carers, uh, which this is the, the my this was my step into this project. Uh, uh, and the, the, I learned a lot about and I've met a lot of people, so it's really interesting. And then there are some meetings for clients and relatives. They are called Bunter Nachmittag, so they meet once a month in the afternoon. And uh, we are going to start uh, outdoor activities this year in autumn. I think it will it, it will be a bit like like the the, the health walks we have we heard before. Uh, we are thinking about things like that. The next one, please. Yeah, this project um, was based on on the experiences of a project which took place in the city of Klosterneuburg, which is also. Uh, located in the biosphere reserve Wienerwald and also close to the to the uh, border of, of the city of Vienna. It took place in 2017 to 2020. Mm. Uh, yeah, and there it was. They they were focusing on on a positive attitude towards dementia. They were forming a network and they were also forming steering group about five to eight eight persons. And there was a the um, a partner organization. Uh, Caritas, which is a social organization, they are um, um, covering all kinds of social aspects and regulations. For the project uh, we have in Wienerwald, um, we are also forming a network. And we are, there's also a steering group and there's also Caritas as a leading partner in this project uh, to gain uh, experience. They have their experiences in all kinds of social aspects and, and, and uh, the regulations, so they are really a um, good partner for these kind of activities. The next one, please. Uh, it's just to mention there are other project, projects in the biosphere reserve so Wienerwald as well. Um, sorry, but these projects are just in German. Um, uh, Miteinander Demenz, weil ich es Hitzing. Hitzing is a, a district of Vienna, it's the search in district, and they are uh, working as a kind of, of social. Um, a um, house, I would say, and they are um, covering and uh, those activities for this district. Uh, and the Austrian Federal Forest Organization is also has also some 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 programs. They have they have some guiding programs under the name, under the name of Wildlife. They offer guided tours for um, people uh, with dementia and their their relatives. But they're just at the very beginning, but they have uh, introduced their guides. And so, yeah, uh, I don't know that uh, if they have, have done really some activities. Um, yeah. The next one, please. Yeah, there are, there are some, you can see some, some informations and uh, the, the links we have to the, to the project. Um, I'm sorry, but they are just available in German. <laughs> but anyway. I think if there, if anyone has a, a good translator, you will find the main information as well. Yeah, the next one, please. Yeah, uh, if you need some information, some more information, you can contact me. There's what is my 
private um, email. And you can also reach me at the uh, Naturpark Sparbach, um, where I'm more or less during the day. <laughs> yeah, so uh, so if you want some more information, feel free. So I think this is the last one. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Suzanne. Really interesting too. Um, just a question for me and see if, see if others want to pick up questions on the chat. Uh, I, I guess you've emphasized there the scale of potential demand, uh, yep. given, the, given the size of your population in the, in the region and, and the age of them. Um, so given that, what, what do you, can you say anything about what you think what the success will look like in terms of this project when it comes towards the end? The, the one just, uh, the running one? Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah, I think uh, the, the the main focus is uh, the focused areas are more or less uh, the ones that that, uh, that that the aims that uh, we are on on the track we are getting forward. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, even the establishing uh, the this uh, first pay place of a day uh, uh, care structure is really uh, a good thing because uh, um, at those uh, those tables when we are meeting. There are a lot of people they are just saying, wow, it would be really nice if there is a kind of, uh, of, 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 of daycare where I can bring my relative, my husband, my mom, whatever. Um, and, and I can have one uh, just half a day or a day off uh, for personal needs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is, um, I would really say, first step and the necessary step. But I think in all those communities which are uh, included in this uh, VF, uh, V5, I think it, there's, uh, there will be very soon the need for uh, a daycare, um, uh, uh, a place for daycare uh, 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 in in every in every community, more or less. I think this will be the next mm -hmm. step. Okay. Because you, you, in between there are you have to, to to have you have to have a transport or you have to have one who who takes the the the, the suffering one, bringing um, him or her over there. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And I can hog the floor a bit. So, in terms of you've talked about health walks and guided walks, mm -hmm. were, were these existing programs which have been um, altered uh, and uh, linked to the to the project, or are they totally new? Uh, they projects? will be new in this project. Um, but till now, there, there are no uh, guided walks, but we will we will try to start this in 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 autumn when the the landscape is really colorful so i think it's it's a good idea to start like this but and, and just with the uh, short walks we have also defined some areas where we can do that okay really interesting and final question for me i can't encourage anyone to come forward or put some things in the chat um are there any lessons in terms of that um that first step that you took in terms of the round tables, the discussions you're having between, uh, I guess, environment and local authority and the health sector here. Um, was it, are you surprised how long it took or have those discussions been easy to arrange? Have you had all the right partners around the table at the beginning or have you had to repeat some of those discussions moving forward? I think it was really good to start this project uh, based on the evidence of the of the of the one uh, which took place in Kloster Neuburg uh, the years before. Mm -hmm. So there was a um, I, I think there was a quite uh, quite good basic information and and uh, about how things work and uh, about the partners which are uh, really useful and helpful in this in this process. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's really, really interesting. Has anyone got any other questions? I can't see any in the chat, Anna. Uh, does anyone want to come forward with any observations about uh, the two case studies or any activity happening in their parks or regions? If so, put up your hand and be brave and come on screen. I can't see anyone. Um, okay. Well, I, I think I'll just wrap up then and um, we can go away and reflect on what we've heard, which has been really stimulating. Um, I took a, a number of number of things away from all of that, um, which I'll just sort of, oh, we have got a question. Let's uh, let, is it Petrit? Apologies for my pronunciation. Do you want to come on and ask a question or say something?
sorry, I, ha I saw a hand go up, but I can't see anyone anymore. Okay, <laughs> hands gone down. Um, so some observations, I guess, I pulled out from both case studies. Um, one thing I hadn't really thought about before was about the approach for dealing or uh, uh, developing dementia-friendly programs is relevant to lots of green health activity. And I think one of the slides Gordon put up about the risk factors for um, uh, dementia are, are about population health um, factors and the general visitor to, to our parks and protected areas is definitely getting some of those factors reduced. So the relevance there is more than just dementia, some of the things we've heard about today. Um, as I said, you can't help but be struck about the importance of being in and observing nature here in terms of the health benefits and the evidence uh, that was presented. Uh, and that's observation is one of the five ways to well-being that I talked about. Uh, so there's a definitely connection to the to the program, the wider program here. Um, I think in both case studies we we heard about the importance of co-production. Uh, so that's a bit of jargon, but it's about talking to talking to all people, stakeholders, and also the users of these programs as well in developing them. And there's lots of good practice going on across parks in that area, but can't stress it enough, the importance of, of those discussions. We obviously uh, heard about personal narrative, the importance of personal narrative and evidence in, in how we communicate some of this and the discussions with health sector professionals in particular. Um, something that struck me from Suzanne's presentation in particular, uh, for parks which do have populations, I suspect those populations are aging probably more rapidly than uh, urban populations or the populations of the countries as a whole. So this becomes a real uh, frontline issue for those, those parks. And also from Suzanne's uh, presentation about that importance of a wider regional approach and thinking beyond your park boundary uh, around uh, how the park can make a strategic contribution here through its work. And then the final one to pick up, I thought was really interesting, was about the importance of social organisations and businesses, social enterprises, we'd call them in the UK, as partners. Um, so actually, it's, sometimes it's about finding the right partner to help deliver the programme, rather than necessarily running yourself. And these organisations have, have tend to have lots of expertise and passion and can bring in money as well in a way that sometimes public bodies struggle with. So some really interesting uh, uh, common threads, I think, can be drawn out from those two presentations. I uh, hope you've enjoyed that. I hope that's been useful. Um, would welcome feedback. Anna's going to post into the chat a, a feedback form. Mandatory for everyone who attended, of course. No, not mandatory, but please fill it in because it's really useful for us to, to reflect about future webinars. And on that subject, uh, just a little advert. Uh, for two things. Um, in November, there's the, uh, the annual Europark Federation Conference. Uh, it's, it's a biggie because the Europark Federation is 50 years old, uh, and it also ties in with a celebration of Dutch national parks. So Anna will put some uh, information in the chat about that too. Uh, we're having a workshop. Uh, or the HPHP program is having a workshop and a marketplace. So if you're coming to the conference, uh, do come and have a chat to us either at the marketplace or join the workshop where we'll be trying to walk the talk and um, practice the five ways well in practice. So if you want to learn more about that, that's a good workshop to join. And then in November, I think we'll be having another webinar topic to be confirmed, but we might uh, rephrase, the, rephrase the webinar we did last year about project activity and what's happening in terms of project developments and learning from some of the things we heard about some of the projects we heard about in 22. So hopefully that will be of interest and we'll see you again. Uh, just looking at Anna, is there anything else I need to say Anna before I close? Mm, not that I can think of. <laughs> Good. Uh, I don't see also more questions. Okay. Um, thank you Pete and thank you, you everyone. Thank you. And I guess the last word then to Gordon and Suzanne for their presentations, which were really informative and hopefully have got us all thinking about this topic area. So thank you. Thanks again. And thanks to everyone for spending an hour of their lives with us. Thank you very much. We'll see you again soon. Bye for now.